This evening we will be making use of the new hymnals following the, the order of prayer at the close of day that begins on page 225. Uh, for the most part we're going to, to speak the responses rather than, than, than sing those. I've indicated with, uh, into your hands I commend my spirit where we will sing and we will all join together in singing the song of, song of Simeon. Most of the service is in your service bulletin. So we make our beginning. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord. To herald your love in the morning. Join to sing hymn 425, Go to Dark Gethsemane. Please stand. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Let us confess our sins in the presence of God and of one another. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you in our thoughts, in our words, in our deeds, and in all that we have not done. Forgive us in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Deliver and restore us that we may rest in peace. By the mercy of God, we are redeemed by Jesus Christ, and in him we are forgiven. Let us rest in his peace until the rising of the sun, when we shall serve him in newness of life. Amen. May we be seated. We join to sing Psalm 16.
Lord Jesus, we thank you for the delightful inheritance you won for us through your death and resurrection. Stay by our side on the journey through this life and guide us with the counsel of your word. When our life here is ended, fill us with joy in your presence. For you live and rule with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Continue this evening with our reading of the Passion History. Tonight we hear of Jesus' agony of soul in Gethsemane. When Judas had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new command I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Then Jesus said to them, You will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter answered him, Though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Peter said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny three times that you know me. And he said to them, When I sent you out with no money bag or knapsack or sandals, did you lack anything? They said, Nothing. He said to them, But now let the one who has a money bag take it and likewise a knapsack, and let the one who has no sword sell his cloak and buy one. For I tell you that this scripture must be fulfilled in me. And he was numbered with the transgressors. For what is written about me has its fulfillment. And they said, Look, Lord, here are two swords. And he said to them, It is enough. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to his disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed. My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, 
Sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. So far our reading. Into your hands I commend my spirit. To your hands I commend my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, God of truth. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Grace, mercy, and peace are yours through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. This evening, once again, we take a look, another look at another one of Prophet Zechariah's Holy Week prophecies. We read from Zechariah chapter 11, verses 7 to 13. So I pastured the flock marked for slaughter, particularly the oppressed of the flock. Then I took two staffs and called one favor and the other union, and I pastured the flock. In one month, I got rid of the three shepherds. The flock detested me, and I grew weary of them and said, I will not be your shepherd. Let the dying die and the perishing perish. Let those who are left eat one another's flesh. Then I took my staff called favor and broke it, revoking the covenant I had made with all the nations. It was revoked on that day, and so the afflicted of the flock who were watching me knew it was the word of the Lord. I told them, if you think it best, give me my pay, but if not, keep it. So they paid me 30 pieces of silver. And the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter, the handsome price at which they priced me. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them into the house of the Lord to the potter. This is the word of the Lord. What's it worth to you? Now, in some form or another, we really face that question every day. And whether you're talking about spending money or some effort or time, what's it worth to you? Is it worth it to get a, a coffee at Starbucks or should I make it at home? Is it worth it to go to a nice restaurant and pay you know, $100 or more for a nice dinner, or would I rather have fast food or, or maybe just stay home and make something? Is it worth it to pay to see a movie in the theater, or should I rather just watch something on, on TV at home? Is it worth it to run across town to buy that item on sale, or should I wait to pick it up later or get it somewhere closer? Is it worth it to do it myself, or should I pay someone to do it? Again and again, we face that question, what's it worth? And of course, different people may answer those questions in, in different ways. Some people may spend their money on, on hunting and fishing. Others might prefer movies and entertainment. Some might save and spend their money on, on big items. Others might prefer to splurge a, a little on everyday items. And when it comes to the value that we assign to something, we can have very different ideas from others about what something's worth. Like we have a saying, huh? one man's junk is another man's treasure. Now what people find worthwhile and important in their lives is also reflected in their lives, reflected in their, their budgets, it's reflected in where they spend their money, it's re reflected in where they spend their time. 
Now, Jesus reminds us, where your treasure is there, your heart will be also. And so, what's it worth to you? Often that can be very clearly seen by the way that we live. When the words before us this evening, the prophet Zechariah might change that question just a little bit. He doesn't ask what's it worth to you, but what's he worth to you? What value do you put on Jesus? Zechariah here in these verses describes a man, a man serving as a shepherd who's, who's fed up with his job. He's ready to quit. He's ready to be done. In fact, you can almost hear him yell, I don't care anymore. I've had enough. I quit. But the shepherd was hired to, to pasture the flock, but he wasn't sent to take care of the, the healthy sheep, but the, those sheep that would have been used for dairy and, and wool. His job was to watch over those who were marked for slaughter. In many ways, it was a dead-end job, and he was unappreciated, and he was fed up with his job so that he didn't even care if he got his last paycheck. But they did give him his pay, 30 pieces of silver. 30 pieces of silver was worth about four months' wages for a common worker, so well, we might estimate that at being somewhere between ten and $15,000 today. Not a small amount, but certainly not a great salary for a job where you're overworked and undervalued, unappreciated. 30 pieces of silver offered for services rendered really was an insult to the, to the shepherd. Really said, well, this is what we think you're worth, and it's not a whole lot. Now, these words might have been a description of how Zechariah felt as a prophet of God's rebellious people. And he may have been frustrated with his ministry serving a people who so often failed to listen, who were more concerned about their own physical comfort than they were about the Lord. And so Zechariah may himself have been tempted to say, fine, well, I'll just leave you alone. I'll quit preaching. I'm done. But more than just describing his own frustration, Zechariah was prophesying about Jesus. Now, Jesus is the good shepherd. Now, the good shepherd had a care for his people that is perfect. He loved them dearly. He always had only their best interests at heart. Of course, the, the people so often weren't interested in having Jesus shepherd them. You know, they wanted a bread king. They wanted a, a political liberator. Think of after Jesus' feeding of the 5,000 when the, the crowd sought him out for the wrong reasons. Jesus plainly told them, I tell you the truth, you're looking for me not because you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Really, they wanted other shepherds. They didn't want to follow Jesus' lead, and so they rejected him. And according to Jesus' own words, there's really only two kinds of shepherds, good and bad. Well, how shocking here to hear the sheep call the good shepherd bad. You hear him say, oh, the flock detested me. Now they cried out, crucify him, crucify him. And that detesting grieved Jesus. He, he wept. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Well, the good shepherd cared for the sheep. The time comes when the good shepherd Fortunately, we'll make his final announcement, I will not be your shepherd. Now that finds its final fulfillment with the awful words on judgment day, depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. 
And finally, as pictured by Zechariah, that staff called favor is broken. Now, that staff symbolizing God's grace, how that God would then withdraw His grace. And all that's left then is judgment for those who have rejected. Like just after our reading, we're told that staff called union is also broken. A unity, important, especially when we think of unity between God and His people. A unity that doesn't exist by nature because of sin which separates from God. And so the flock wants to be free from the shepherd. The, the flock, we're told, detests the shepherd. Even that, that one who has the flock's best interests at heart. Shocking, huh? The sheep turn on their own shepherd. They want to get rid of him. And again, what do they think he's worth? Well, 30 pieces of silver. That was the price you'd pay for a slave. 30 pieces of silver. It was an insult. Now, the faithful shepherd who gave so much, and what were they willing to pay in, in return? 10,000, 15,000. These words here find their ultimate fulfillment in Judas. Matthew tells us in his gospel, when Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the 30 silver coins to the chief priests and the elders. I have sinned, he said, for I have betrayed innocent blood. What is that to us, they replied. That's your responsibility. So Judas threw the money into the temple and left. Then he went away and hanged himself. The chief priest picked up the coins and said, it's against the law to put this into the treasury since it's blood money. So they decided to use the money to buy the potter's field as a burial place for foreigners. That is why it has been called the field of blood to this day. Then what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. They took the 30 silver coins, the price set on him by the people of Israel, and they used them to buy the potter's field as the Lord commanded me. Matthew there makes reference really as a combination of prophecies. There's part of it, one is from Jeremiah and one is from here in Zechariah. And since Jeremiah is a major prophet and Zechariah one of the minor prophets, Matthew simply attributes the combined prophecy to Jeremiah. Now Judas betrayed Jesus for 30 silver coins. When Judas saw what he had done, he was filled with remorse, threw the money back into the temple in despair, committed suicide. And the leaders then used that blood money to buy the potter's field as a, as a burial plot for strangers. And so Zechariah's words of prophecy were fulfilled. And for Judas, well, he thought he'd rather have 30 pieces of silver than have Jesus. And what's he worth to you? That was the question that he asked the chief priests, and that was his answer. 30 pieces of silver. Zechariah says the handsome price that was paid for his blood was 30 pieces of silver. How humiliating. Huh? Handsome, precious. I mean, a certain sarcasm there by the Lord is certainly that price was anything but precious for something for someone so priceless. And so Jesus, the good shepherd, worth only 30 pieces of silver. Now Judas wouldn't have gotten rich on the money had he kept it. The potter's field that was bought with it was not some choice real estate there in Jerusalem. Instead, it remained a monument to what the world thought, really, of, of shepherds, of God's faithful ministers in general, and it certainly showed what they thought of the good shepherd in particular. Like Zechariah's, people paid more for the care of their bodies than they, they thought they needed to pay for the care of their souls. Consider Naaman the leper. He came to be healed in his body with 750 pounds of silver and 150 pounds of gold. But salvation and healing of the soul? Well, the people of Israel thought 30 pieces of silver, that, that'll do. Insult 
to the blood of the Lamb. Now, Jesus' work as shepherd was free. Salvation is free, but it wasn't cheap. It was accomplished not with 30 pieces of silver, but with Jesus' holy, precious blood and with His innocent suffering and death. The money, the riches, the earthly treasures and pleasures, those things that seemed good to Judas, so good that he was willing to be, betray his Savior. Now how fleeting those things are. For Judas, they weren't able to calm his troubled conscience. They weren't able to, to give him any lasting peace and happiness. And finally, they couldn't rescue him from hell. How tempting the treasures of this world can seem to us. How easy for us to think, well, if I only had this, then I would really be happy. How easy for us to misplace our priorities by spending all our time chasing after the pleasures and treasures of this world. But those things finally will not last. Our first and chief concern needs to be our soul's eternal welfare. We need, first of all, to be concerned with spiritual riches. And Judas, then, is a, is a strong warning of what can happen when money and the things of this world become more important than Jesus and His Word. And like the people of Israel, like Judas, fortunately, we have to confess that we aren't always interested in having Jesus shepherd us. We, too aren't always interested in listening to him and following. But we do well to ask, what's he worth to you? What's Jesus worth? How much would it take for you to betray him? 10,000? 15,000? Would you pretend you didn't know him for 50,000? For 100,000? I think we'd all like to answer, no, uh, never. I'd never sell out Jesus. I'd never give up my faith for any amount of money. But the truth is, there are those times that really we sell him out for much less. And we trade Jesus for the acceptance of our friends. We trade Jesus for a few hours of entertainment or sleep. We sell out to those hoard the, the money that Jesus enables and allows us to earn rather than returning a generous portion to Him and for His gospel work. We undervalue the Good Shepherd when we spend all our effort and energy on entertainment instead of devotion and play instead of prayer. How greatly we value oh, that me time rather than spending more time with Him. And here's our financial statements, our credit card bills, our schedules, often testify against us, don't they? The fact is, the price that we often put on Jesus is even less than that one that Judas did. And for that, we deserve punishment. We deserve to have Jesus take His staff favor that favor that he shows us and, and to break it, to be done with us. Now we who so often undervalue and, and sell him out, we deserve to have him quit and be done with us. That's what we deserve. But our good shepherd is more than patient. He loves us too much to leave us on our own. He shows us a undeserved love. It goes beyond what we could imagine. You know, if Jesus were asked, what is that sinner worth to you? And he would say without hesitation, that sinner is worth everything. That sinner is worth my life. And in undeserved love for you and me, Jesus stretched out his arms on the cross and suffered the punishment for your sins, proving how precious you are to Him. Now, did you notice what seems to be a disagreement between the prophecy 
and the fulfillment. In Zechariah, it's Jesus who throws the money into the temple. In, in Matthew, of course, it's Judas. Could we have a contradiction, a, maybe a close but not quite fulfillment of this prophecy? No. Reminded of is that Jesus was so in control of everything that happened to him, he was willing to be sold for 30 pieces of silver. It's really as though Jesus himself made that deal. As Jesus was pleased to be betrayed with a kiss, pleased to be handed over to his enemies, pleased to be sentenced to die. So much did he desire our salvation. Now he could have come down from the cross, he could have walked away at any time. But in love for you and for me, he was willing to be sold by Jesus and really at what might consider a pathetic cost. Certainly not anything close to his worth. But we now know what he's really worth. Uh, we know that he's worth far more than 30 pieces of silver. Uh, Jesus paid for our sins. He paid for our salvation. He redeemed us from sin, death, and the devil. Not with gold or silver, but with his precious blood and with his innocent sufferings and death. In fact, is Jesus is our greatest treasure. As the psalm writer says, Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. And so now by faith, are able to value him the way that he deserves. Now we seek to glorify his name with all that we have and with all that we do. And we gladly give him offerings of our possessions and of our time. We show what he's worth by the way that we worship and by the, the way that we're willing to make our lives living sacrifices for him. So what's he worth to you? Is he worth giving up a few toys and luxuries, a, a couple nights out or a little entertainment so that you might support his church with your gifts? Is he worth the time might have to give to come and serve in his house? Is he worth the, the discomfort maybe of talking to him, talking about him to friends and neighbors? Although the people of Zechariah's day and, and the people of, of Jesus' own time really answered not much to that question of what's he worth to you, by God's grace we know better. We know that He is worth everything. He is our precious, priceless Savior. Amen. The peace of God that passes all understanding will keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's join then to sing hymn 396, Christ the life of all the living.
Lord Jesus, it is with humble hearts that we lay this offering on your altar. The most we can give is but a mite compared to your love, which sent you to the cross for us and showers us now with many blessings every day. Lord, whom we love, accept our offering and ever strengthen our will to give. Amen. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings. In righteousness I shall see you. When I wait through your presence, will give me joy. Be present, O merciful God, and protect us through the silent hours of this night, so that we who are wearied by the changes and chances of this fleeting world may rest in your eternal changelessness through Jesus Christ our Lord. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us praise the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless us and keep us. Amen. And be seated, we close with our final hymn, Hymn 402, Glory Be to Jesus. <laughs> 